good afternoon and welcome to all of you for this third session of ipc master class biosafety we have pleasure of having a very very interesting topic this day i have gone through the slide this is very very interesting so uh, before going to the formal session let me thank sanman healthcare for sponsoring the whole a series of ipc master class first series as well as second series i request you to have a, uh, a one minute one and a half minute or less than that time to watch their video their corporate video uh, and then we'll start the session uh, for this day today thank you for your time for watching this video i once again thanks animate healthcare uh, for the sponsorship of this ipc master class uh, with this i hand over the sessions to dr rangareddy who is the president of infection control academy of india to start the session and chair the session please <clears throat> good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen colleagues uh, it's really a pleasure seeing you all again in this um, Uh, third session of the second series on uh, biosafety <clears throat> um you know i would not go into uh, the detail uh, related to the biosafety uh, series importance and also uh, on various aspects which are related to the uh, design and uh, delivery of this program but certainly you know one thing has to be mentioned here that uh, we had a lot of these messages and calls said that this biosafety series uh, had been invaluable in dealing with uh, uh, the current uh, situation especially the covid-19 situation and also you know getting the practical tips to deal, deal with uh, the day to day issues what they are Uh, facing within the healthcare institutions and also at the community and public health level uh, it is very uh, heartwarming uh, to hear such a positive feedback and uh, i am really glad that you know this series could be of use to more than 1000 people across the globe uh, it is not only about uh, the india but also we have seen for last uh, several sessions uh, several colleagues from both asia africa and also europe joining these programs and we thank all of them and once again i welcome all of you to the third series and just um, a one pointer for those uh, who are joining us for the first time for this series the overall objective is to lower the risk and exposure at all stages in the healthcare uh, related to the biosafety that is that is what actually is the major 
goal, you know, what we have set uh, forward while uh, preparing this uh, series. And uh, I am glad that, you know, in the past uh, two sessions, we could live up to uh, the objective of this particular series. And um, in, the, in the past, you know, we have discussed about uh, a risk to laboratory acquired infections among healthcare workers, and also the risk of release of uh, those infectious agents into the community, surrounding community and the environment, which actually creates uh, a lot of issues uh, for the healthcare system uh, across uh, across the world. And um, you know, the as in the beginning we have talked about, I hope this series and from whatever feedback we have got has really helped actually in order to uh, increase uh, bio risk management skills and competencies among those who are working with infectious diseases. And uh, this series had been made possible by an academic grant from SunMed Healthcare, the largest manufacturers of disinfectants and antiseptics in India. And uh, we at Infection Control Academy and University of Hyderabad uh, have designed this program in consultation with uh, Dr. T.V. Rao and also Dr. Ranganathan Iyer. Um, these are the two people whom I certainly would like to thank once again uh, for their contribution in terms of designing this uh, program. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would not go further into the details and uh, I would just like to uh, take only one minute uh, uh, you know, just to recap what we have done so far. Uh, recapping that is about two sessions uh, in succession what have happened in last two Tuesdays. Uh, one is uh, uh, introducing the concept, its application and importance in spheres of medicine by Dr. Aruna. You know, she has done a fantastic job giving us this uh, concept. And in the uh, second session, Dr. Mustafa has talked about classification of organisms and uh, relevant biosafety precautions with uh, the levels of biosafety which is required in order to make healthcare system safer. And today uh, is going to be at another very important uh, topic. And, um, and I have uh, a pleasure of uh, you know, participation of Dr. Savita in uh, taking the program. And uh, Dr. Savita, just to give a brief, and uh, I'm sure uh, uh, most of you would know her, uh, you know, for her services in uh, the quality, especially the quality control, healthcare quality control. But uh, let me, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the sake of, um, you know, uh, giving the broader, uh, you know, picture about uh, her work, uh, let me give an introduction. Dr. Savita is a clinical microbiologist and uh, she is currently associated uh, as quality head with uh, Jalapa Hospital and Research Center in Kolar, Karnataka. And uh, she has a vast experience of 21 years, especially dealing with uh, the quality issues and the patient safety, which is very, very, very important. And um, she has you know, a special affinity towards uh, uh, hospital infection control and uh, disaster management in healthcare. And uh, with her vast experience, I think, you know, she could make a lot of difference in those institutions where she had associated it uh, at uh, different levels. Dr. Savita is empaneled with uh, NQS, NABH, uh, Green Healthcare, uh, you know, QAI assessor and a resource person for NHSRC. And she is also trained in Singapore for advanced tracers in auditing for a giant commission international. Uh, so with this uh, brief, um, I would request now Dr. Savita to take over. Uh, Ma'am, it's a real pleasure having you today. I'm sure you know this session is going to make a lot of difference for our audience across the world. Uh, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Rangaredi, sir, uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity. My sincere gratitude to you and uh, also an opportunity to meet uh, uh, a wide uh, platform of people here. I hope um, you will all enjoy this session as much as I enjoyed uh, preparing for it. 
uh, this topic of uh, biosafety violation and bioterrorism was always uh, in my mind but this opportunity gave me uh, a chance to get into various articles and various um, uh, literatures when i searched i was so thrilled you know to know so much about bioterrorism which at least i didn't know and i thought i'll put all those across uh, in this uh, webinar and i'm sure uh, you will also enjoy knowing a lot of uh, facts which go with, uh, with bioterrorism so this um, a topic of bioterrorism is uh, no new uh, to the world uh, according to cdc they define it as a deliberate release of viruses bacteria or other agents used to cause illness or death in people now what is more interesting is this uh, deliberate attempt is not only for human beings they also do it for animals and plants and i'll tell you how it affects the complete economy of a country so this bioterrorism aims to create casualties terror societal disruption or economic loss inspired by ideological religious or political beliefs now you don't know what is behind the minds of these people but these people get into this wrong uh, practices of uh, the violation of the safety rules the biosafety rules now uh, when i looked into uh, what is uh, bioterrorism there's another um, topic which also comes parallel to bioterrorism is biocrime now uh, there are usage of these uh, microbiology or these uh, agents these um, microbiological agents to kill sometimes maybe individuals or uh, a group of people which is usually motivated by revenge or monetary gain which you know there it keeps happening many times we don't um, go behind the scene and see and it could be a bio crime so it's very important for us when we are discussing bioterrorism the concept of bio crime as well so this bioterrorism um, not only I, as i told you um, you know brings in a havoc uh, um, you know um, in uh, human lives but they also uh, target animals and plants and when they target the whole system of uh, the country goes down and there's huge economic losses and especially the infecting the livestock and infecting the crops they contaminate buildings and subsequently you know you may have the country may have to ban the export of animals meat and derived products or they may also have you know all this leads to a lot of economic loss in the country so just to quote a few examples the foot and mouth disease in uk you know this directly affected the private and pu public sectors and there was an estimated loss of 18 8 billion euros and in 2003 avian influenza outbreak in netherlands they saw 800 million euro loss and there was direct cost and loss of trade for dutch government and industry and a clean up of various buildings so whenever you know you are seeing so much live now with covid and you you have to clean up the buildings clean up the areas and god knows so much of expenditure goes off and uh, this leads to a big concern in the countries uh, when uh, you know these uh, these these things just happen now i was just looking at corona virus and uh, the new the novel corona virus 2019 is it a bio weapon now this is something which is a common uh, point of discussion everywhere now when i try to find out more about it this article journal of bioterrorism and bio defense they say chinese think that it's us germs warfare conspiracy americans think that it is because of china and because of they uh, going and uh, you know disrupting their biological weapon program and they say you know link it to the wuhan laboratory and they say it's a release of you know a uh, uh, purposeful release of the virus and when it goes to russia russian scientists believe that americans have done it and they think that america has created a corona virus episode in wuhan to disturb china and when you go to israel israel thinks again it is china they think that it's again linked to the wuhan laboratory whereas an american scientist himself says that th there is no evidence of this virus you know uh, uh, being uh, you know used as a bio weapon because it doesn't have the characteristics of a bio weapon or a bio virus and um, when you look into a lot of bio safety violations in the world where, which is happening you know bio safety will come in detail in the further lectures as well so it is very important for us to store the bio the microorganisms which we are storing in our laboratory so once the safety rules are violated and once the organisms come out of these laboratories 
a havoc is going to happen so the same way cdc was blamed for you know having uh, let loose certain smallpox um, virus samples certain h5n1 uh, h5n1 virus samples from their laboratory so like this uh, biosafety violations do keep happening but it is all our responsibility at least now india has opened eyes to covid 19 and we have seen how a virus once released can you know bring so much of disturbance in our lives in our economic lives personal lives professional lives so the biosafety violation uh, so now what what actually are these biological weapons now generally when people choose biological weapon they may choose the microorganisms like you and i have seen they could use organisms like anthrax or plague or they could also genetically engineer it and leave it in the community so this could be one way second is they could use the bioactive substances derived from these organisms like the products of metabolism like it could be toxins hormones cytokines which have all been released in the past and we've seen a lot of uh, disaster happen due to these they could also use certain artificially designed biologically mimicking substances i will talk about a lot of sarin or nerve gases or pesticides which are used which bind to the cell receptors and cause death so like this when it comes to biological weapons they could use any of these and cause you know terror now what are these ideal agents of weaponization what are these agents when uh, what what are the characteristics they look for when they are trying to put these into the community they want to see that they should be highly infectious they should be effective in small quantities to achieve a desired impact so they want to see that it should just disperse into the air so once it is dispersed into the air it goes and reaches a large community readily grown or produced in large quantities you know they want something which is you know stable in storage and also preferred to be readily delivered you know just like that and it should be resistant to climatic changes and they look for some uh, you know Uh, organisms which should be resistant to conventional antibiotics and treatments, so that people, you know, once they gain these infection, they suffer. So these are the criteria for choosing a bio weapon for people. Now, how do they deliver these? So generally, it could be delivered through missiles, aircraft, motor vehicles, hand pump sprayer, suitcase or box, umbrella-like weapons, robot, robotic delivery systems. Now, these are the paths. We have seen a lot of deliveries through these. now we'll have to have a keen watch on what they may do in the future as well so cdc as such has categorized the bioterrorism agents into a b c categories now what are these category a agents category a agents are the one which have high priority agents they are you know they are they are picked up first because of their i told you the nature they may be more stable they may be you know they could be dispersed into air and they could be easily used to the disturb a big large population in a community so they could have they pose national security risk and they easily transmitted and disseminated they have high mortality rate so once you use them in a community their idea of you know gaining high mortality is obtained and it has a major public health impact now all, i want all of you to look at these agents now category a agents are anthrax botulism plague smallpox tularemia ebola marburg hemorrhagic fever lassa fever argentine hemorrhagic fever now these are the agents which have and may also be used in the future who can be potentially very dangerous now when we know that they've been used these agents we have to make a list of them and be very very cautious about them because they could also be used in future because we have an experience with it now category b agent now in category a anthrax is always preferred you know when it comes to bioterrorism very easily because this is this has the stability for decades in the spore form and also the ease of production of anthrax spores so this has always been a favorite of terrorists the bioterrorists now when it comes to category b now these are the agents which could easily disseminate and uh, this preferably has some low mortality rate when it comes to uh when we have seen them you know where they have chosen them as uh, just to create some kind of a um you know just a panic in um, the community so that people are scared and uh, they don't uh, you know they don't go to work and they bring their economy down and all this 
So usually the agents used here are acute fever, brucellosis, glanders, Venezuela encephalomyelitis, Eastern equine encephalomyelitis, Western equine encephalomyelitis, ricin. I'll talk more about this. Clostridium perfringens. Staph enterotoxin B, Salmonella, Shigella dysenterium, E. coli 0157H7, Vibrio cholerae, Cryptosporidium parvum. So these are the agents categorized as B because of the lower mortality rate. Again, we have the next category, category C. Now, we cannot take any of these agents for granted. Now, they are category C because they are emerging pathogens and we have to be very, very careful because we have to think, you know, we have to keep in our minds that these could be the potential bio uh, weapons in the future. They are possibly engineerable. Now, you have Nipah virus, Hunter virus, tick-borne hemorrhagic fever, tick-borne encephalitis virus, yellow fever, and multidrug resistant tuberculosis. They are really in the pipeline and we should always keep them in our minds because they could any time be used as a bioweapon. Now you have a poll question. Bioterrorism is defined as a deliberate release of viruses, bacteria or other agents used to cause illness or death in human beings only and not in animals or plants. Is it true or false? Yeah, you can simply respond. Uh, just below the video, you can see the question. Please see the question below the video and respond to it. Good. We are getting response from, I think, uh, the audience looks divided equally almost. Uh, we'll publish the result in a few seconds. Uh, we, we, yeah, well, we'll wait for next 10 seconds, please, to respond to the poll. Most everybody is responding. Yeah, good. I think good number of people have responded that. And I'm going to end the poll now. And then you will be able to see the response, which is interesting response here now. Uh, okay, end. Yeah. So 44% of the participants uh, feel it true. Remaining 55% says false. Over to speaker, Dr. Shavida. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next uh, slide. Now, uh, there's a beautiful history with this bioterrorism. Now, I will, um, this was uh, quite interesting for me to collect details about the history of bioterrorism because this gives us an idea on how people really use bioorganisms for terrorism. And we can always be cautious about it uh, when it comes to our future. Now, it was the first 14th century BC where they used Francisella tularensis. You know, it was also called as Hittite plague an epidemic of tularemia and the first record of biological warfare. Then when we see, there were these Scythian archers who infected their arrows by dipping them in decomposing bodies or in blood mixed with manure as far back as 400 BC. And they were... Sorry, I can't see the slide. So can you see the slide? Thank you. So they, they were also Persians, Greek and Romans uh, in about 300 BC itself where they quote examples of crude dumping of animal and human cadavers into water. And uh, the water was meant for armies and for public uh, civilian populations. They would go just dump uh, human bodies into it and they poisoned the water. And they may also use rye, ergot or hellebore during the siege of Crissa, when we look into the history, which, you know, would lead to violent, um, uh, uncontrollable vomiting and diarrhea. And, you know, slowly the people would give up and they would defeat the war. So they would use uh, this kind of poisoning of water resources in war. And then you see that in um, 1346, they used plague infected corpse, uh, corpses or the bodies, dead bodies into the city in an attempt to cause an epidemic within the enemy's forces. So when we see at uh, the time, the same time, 1347, when Mon Mongol forces, they actually use these plague infested bodies and they would, you know, uh, use it over the walls into the Black Sea. And they also, when when they were traveling, you know, in from the Italy with the plague, they started this, this uh, concept of Black Death started from Italy 
and then from there it it swept through the europe and for about 25 million people were killed from plague because of the way you know it is also a part of bioterrorism in 1485 you know what the spanish did spanish would supply their french enemies with wine laced with leprosy patients blood this was the different ways in which they tried to plan bioterrorism in 1797 napoleon you know he attempted to force the surrender of mantua by infecting the citizens with malaria so once they were all down with malaria they kind of you know gave up when we look into the broad history of bioterrorism in the 15th century itself you know they used this variola virus you know they 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 put it onto the cloth and they distributed it to people and we also have examples of putting smallpox spores onto the uh, you know um, handkerchiefs or blankets and give it as a goodwill and then people you know get smallpox so uh, there was um, dr anton gilger who grew cultures of pseudomonas malaria which was supplied by german government and they said put it on the you know um, um, they give it to the dock workers and uh, they almost infected about 3000 horses mules and cattle which were destined and they you know there was huge devastation of animals in europe at that point of time so this you can see how the blankets were given as a goodwill and they you know uh, mixed it contaminated with smallpox spores in it in modern times also you know from 1900s when you see the concept of bioterrorism actually you know started with anthrax and went with anthrax so there was during during world war 1 the german army developed anthrax glanders cholera and wheat fungus specifically used as biological weapons so when you look at all these historical events you will see that this went on from the 12th century 14th century 15th century there were all many examples of bioterrorism so looking at all this in 1925 there was a geneva protocol which prohibited you know using storing or you know any kind of um you know misusing of bio weapons and this uh, 108 nations signed this uh, protocol and this was in 1925 so this was the first multilateral agreement that extended broad of chemical agents to biological agents so they kind of said from chemical to biological we will all prohibit either manufacturing it or storing it or uh, you know disseminating it but what they didn't do is unfortunately no method for verification of the compliance was addressed so though they signed the treaty a lot of countries still you know continued manufacturing and storing it so it was in world war 2 uh, pictures are very very disturbing to actually even take up and put it on the slide when uh, you know japanese forces operated a secret biological warfare research facility in manchuria that carried out human experiments on prisoners so it said that about 3000 victims to plague anthrax syphilis and other agents in an attempt to develop and absorb the disease so some victims were executed or uh, executed or died from these infections and later after they died they even looked at the autopsies they studied the autopsies for a greater understanding of the human body and the disease so in 1942 uh it was it was united states which formed the war research service, service and they had sufficient quantities of botulinum toxin so this is another agent uh, which uh, they used thoroughly for bioterrorism so they uh, stored these bio uh, botulinum toxins in anthrax which is stockpiled in 1944 the british you know tested anthrax bombs on greenard island off the northwest coast of scotland so you can see this picture where, where it says that be careful don't come to this place we have anthrax bombs placed here so a real uh, our clear board says that don't come to this area so during the vietnam war they used these punji sticks they called as punji sticks they were needle sharp the punji sticks were dipped in feces to cause severe infections when they stab onto this enemy's back so this was another way of a uh, bioterrorism british operation foxley now this was uh, during 1944 when uh, they wanted
uh, um, you know um, depth or devastation now uh, looking at all this what was done so i told you about 1925 international treaties about 108 countries came together and they signed a, a treaty saying that we will not continue with this anymore at the same time 1972 there was a biological weapons convention convention on the prohibition of development production and stockpiling of bacteriological and toxic weapons and destruction it was signed by 103 nations so these were the two important um um you know um, um what you call um, uh, these were two important uh, treaties which were signed after so much of bioterrorism was happening in the world in 1977 another release of anthrax from uh, a weapons facility in ussr later in 1992 they admitted that it was russia who did it now another poll question for all of you what are these category a agents is it anthrax botulism plague smallpox tularemia is it true or false just below the video you have the poll question anthrax yeah we are getting response now so some of the people are responding in chat box no need to respond in the chat box you can see below your video this option comes a true and false option below the statement so you can use that and uh, this time uh, it looks very very interesting uh, result actually uh, almost everybody is opting for one answer good and that's to uh, i'm ending the poll now because it's very simple uh, and the result is here 95% says true only 4% says false over to speaker please go ahead thank you thank you sir so uh so this was what was about terrorism in 1985 iraq you know this is all in the modern times 1985 iraq began an offensive biological weapons program producing anthrax botulinum and eflatoxin so following the persian gulf war iraq disclosed that it had bombs and also the biological weapons so they also had these spray tanks which fitted to aircraft that would distribute agents over a specific target so in september and october 1984 you know this another interesting uh, incident happens so with 751 people intentionally infected with salmonella an agent that causes food poisoning when followers of the bhagwan shri rajneesh contaminated restaurant salad bars in oregon so this was another uh, very uh, well known incident of uh, bioterrorism and or if you call it as bio crime and in 1994 a japanese sect of om shinkryo cult attempted an aerosolized uh, release of anthrax from the top of buildings in tokyo so this was another interesting incident and i'll tell you something about sarin sarin is a uh, what do you call it? it's a man made toxin sarin is a human made chemical warfare agent used as a nerve agent this was used widely in the past as a Uh, you know terrorizing agent these nerve agents are the most toxic and rapidly acting on the known chemical warfare agents and it was originally developed in 1930, 1938 in germany it acts similar to organophosphate pesticide probably even more potent than organophosphorus pesticide so it can evaporate into vapor like gas and spread into the environment so they used it uh, two times terrorist attacks in japan in 1994 and 95 so you can uh see this uh om shikryo cult uh, who attacked tokyo subways with this nerve gas sarin killing 12 and injuring more than 5000 so this was a uh, well known incident and uh, we need to keep all these things in our mind so in 2001 anthrax was delivered by mail to us media and government offices and there were about five deaths as a result of this so this uh people of my generation uh, definitely remember this so this happened uh, and people opened the mail uh, to see uh, a powder and this uh, just dispersed the spores of anthrax now there's another component like sarin is ricin 
Raisin, we all must know, again was a very potent uh, agent used in the past as a uh, terror, uh, terrorizing agent. Now, ricin is one of the most toxic and easily produced plant toxins. So, it's derived from plant uh, called uh, ricinus communis. It's mainly manufactured in the world by India, Brazil, and China. And it is a very uh, wanting agent because it has it is not sensitive to either heat or cold. You know, it is it just survives in the normal temperature. And the powder and the mist form when inhaled is very very lethal. So they use the powder and the mist form in the community. So ricin kills cells by damaging protein synthesis. And there's one famous infamous case of assassination employing ricin was the Bulgarian writer Georgi Markov in London in 1978. So we need to look at the past, the agents they've used, and we need to be terribly careful in the future. When we look at other plant toxins used for bioterrorism, we have ricin, abrin, gelonin, lectin, curare. These are few components used in the community as bioterrorist, uh, bioterrorism agents. This, I really didn't know about this. So what is the um, option if you if people have used them is a passive immunization. You can uh, use immune sera containing antibodies against specific bioterror agents and uh, it's used after the confirmed exposure. So this is also a very famous um, uh, usage or infamous usage in the past. And uh, you know in uh, December 2002, six terrorist suspects were arrested in Manchester, England when their apartment, when they searched, they had almost made it as a ricin laboratory. They were producing ricin. And later on Jan 5, 2003, British police raided two residences uh, where they wanted to, you know, make this ricin and attack a Russian embassy. And in Feb 3rd, 2004, three US Senate office buildings were closed after the toxin ricin was found in the mail room. So it's very important for us to know about these agents which have been used uh, in the past as bioterrorism agents. But now uh, we have uh, so much of past. Now, how much are we prepared? We suppose we have a uh, bioterrorism happened in our country, especially country like India. Now we have we are actually looking out in this COVID time. We are desperately looking out for a vaccine. There's so much of economic crisis. There's widespread panic. Now, amidst all this, if it's a bioterror uh, bio attack. Are we ready? Is India ready for this kind of a situation? So, if there is bioterrorism, how do we prepare ourselves? So, for this, I had to refer a few, uh, many articles on how the countries have been, you know, preparing themselves, the other countries. Now, I didn't get much literature on India, but when I looked at the countries which have coped up or now prepared for bioterrorism, they say that the preparedness does not completely depend on doctors or laboratories. It is a combination of intelligence community, law enforcement, enforcement agencies, public health professionals, and the biomedical science. So the combined effect of all of them only can bring a proper preparedness to a bioterrorism plan. Now, any how, any um, country, how does it know that it has been attacked by a biological agent? So suddenly you have an unusual uh, temporal or geographic clustering of illness. Now, you'll have people or persons who attended the same public event or gathering, or you will have several patients presenting with unexplained febrile illness or sepsis or pneumonia or respiratory failure. You have a lot of people presenting similarly. And you may also have an unusual age distribution of common diseases. Like, for example, you may have chicken pox in adults suddenly. So you must think of smallpox. Or you may have a large number of cases of acute flaccid paralysis with prominent bulbar palsy. So which may, you know, give you a, um, a you know, an idea of this could be a botulinum toxin. So you will have to look at the way the community is presenting. So the strategic plan for bioterrorism preparedness and response, how do you make a plan is you have to enhance the capacity for detection. In the country should have very good detection methods, diagnosis methods and management of disease outbreaks. So we should be well trained in all of these in the whole country. We should have improved the characterization and identification of the causative pathogens, toxins or selected chemical exposures. Now, we have to look into the past, look at the agents which have been commonly used, whether it could be microorganisms or their metabolic products or certain 
uh, agents which uh, you know they uh, mimic these bioterrorism agents now we will have to look at them and prepare a proper protocol on them strengthened public health response capacity to control and contain such emergencies now it is very natural that once you have a, a you know a bioterrorism event happened in a community definitely there's panic but it is our duty to train our people the public health to you know not to panic and to you know uh, keep themselves prepared for any of these kind of attacks in the future and information technology infrastructure to rapidly transfer data and information needed to prepare for and respond to these events now you saw in this covid time itself the way the guidelines were distributed and they were just circulated within whatsapp and emails and everywhere the you can see the importance of technology the way the guidelines and the measures which we need to take were just circulated in the social media so that's how you educate the public and that's how you bring all public to confidence and the panic comes down so assessing the local capacity see we should train all the local health officials first so they should be able to identify their strengths and weaknesses we have to ask all our local health officials to give you know openly what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses and we should respond to them we should give good response to them looking at their weaknesses and strengths so develop comprehensive plans associated with bioterrorism preparedness and response now in the laboratory it's very important that in laboratory as you are receiving samples you must be very careful of the six critical agents now all of the laboratory technicians must remember that the six critical agents are easily transmissible between uh, individuals they cause high mortality they cause public panic they cause social disruption and the special action for public health preparedness so these six agents like anthrax plague tularemia botulinum toxin smallpox every laboratory should be aware about you know identification and reporting these agents so we should not be behind in identifying them or making mistakes or be late in identifying them so we should have rapid identification techniques we should the triaging the triaging of samples within the laboratory we should have a certain protocol made in it we should have new labs and staff who provide national capacity to respond to such events we should have an advanced te technology laboratory in the future when we make laboratories we should make specific laboratory protocol we should have a rapid response team for bioterrorism we should teach them we should train them on triages and initially process samples from suspect cases they should give 24 hour diagnostic support to bioterrorism response teams they access they should also look into the new rapid diagnostic assays and transfer it to the national public health laboratory network train the trainer training now across the country we must train people for that you must have a set of master trainers so you train the trainers to the state public health laboratory personnel to enhance the competencies of laboratory personnel to rule out and identify bioterrorism threat agents so when you're continuously training your laboratory people on bioterrorism agents and also giving them the infrastructure and funds they become strong and they don't take much of time or there'll be not much delay in identifying these agents so surveillance and epidemiology the surveillance departments across the country should have this early detection of an event they should be trained on effective and timely response so the epidemi epidemiologists at state and local health agencies need to develop and acquire develop and maintain strategies so the resources and expertise necessary for responding to reports of rare unusual and unexplained illnesses so we should train our train our people to identify the rare microorganisms or rare diseases as well quickly if they are trained appropriately funds now where do the funds come now the country should work on enhancing epidemiology and surveillance capacity so they should hire surveillance coordinators and epidemiologists so they need funds they should identify and train rapid response teams including emergency room physicians infectious disease practitioners should be empowered so you need funds for that you have to uh, encourage motivate the academic institutions in the country to come out with you know uh, ready strategies to deal with these uh, infections and improve overall emergency notification procedures so all this should be you know we should have a proper mock sessions 
and have uh, you know uh, preparedness complete preparedness to all these by terrorist uh, activities now we should have proper reporting mechanism now the healthcare providers um, the reporting mechanisms or to the poison control centers the emergency medical system unit animal healthcare providers and other non traditional partners now animal care providers are also a part of our health so we cannot ignore them so human and animal health are all interrelated now so we have to keep them in confidence with us working with state and local partners instruct them on what to do during an actual bioterrorism event so research and development so research and development development in a country um you know it uh, brings in a lot of strength to the country so investments have to be made in development of vaccines related to diseases on the critical biological agent list especially the category a agent so we must have vaccines to any uh, you know um, uh, organisms as possible mainly targeting variola major bacillus anthracis ersinia pestis clostridium botulinum toxin francisella tularensis filoviruses coxiella burnetii brucella alpha viruses so work to provide insights into how best to prepare the nation to counter bioterrorism so developing national medical and public health policies we need to make very broad policies across the country to protect civilian populations from bioterrorism we have to have the surveillance systems detecting the naturally occurring diseases outbreak and the acts of bioterrorism so we have to differ differentiate the naturally occurring diseases and the bioterrorism events so establishing a center for research and education focused on bioterrorism and conducting studies of viral hemorrhagic fevers as well as critical bioterrorism diseases considered to be greatest threat in the country so to build a response strategy we need to push packages now when it comes to funds we have to utilize this money in you know managing vendors now we should have vendors who will you know very quickly provide us these items in case of a bioterrorist activity event now for example pharmaceutical vendors keep them alert say that if in case there is an um, a, 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 you know attack you have to supply us this much of quantity then you have to have vendors of intravenous and airway supplies emergency medications bandages and dressings antibiotics and other medical material to be requesting agency to give us within 24 to 36 hours so we should develop a network of system where we have trained everybody and kept everybody ready so these are push packages and enhancing the response competencies of the key responders at the central level state level local level we improve our overall chances of combating the consequences of the real bioterrorist event we'll have to make certain mock events sometimes suddenly call for a mock bioterrorist event and see how well prepared the people are so information technology use the computers use the technology to promote develop and support various technologies that will enhance and enable disease detection uh, detection strategies collect and analyze infectious disease data provide real time information to the people help health officials respond to emerging public health incidents and ensure notification of health officials so keeping everybody in the loop through information technology simulated exercises as i was saying you must have plenty of simulated exercises and look at the provision of adequate resources development of mutual beneficial partnerships look at the enhancement of effective public health systems look at the research training and technical support public health capabilities at state and local level and clinical and infection control professionals and veterinary communities enhancing emergency response and how they are coordinated now you have a poll question the final last poll question healthcare providers should maintain awareness of biological agents with bioterrorism potential and consider the presence of unknown pathogens is it true or false yes we started getting response
people say true, 4% people say false. Over to speaker for the comment, please. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I must consider people to be awake. Uh, this uh, very good article on Lancet infectious disease, I think all of you must go through this article, which uh, it is titled as Confronting the Threat of Bioterrorism Realities, Challenges, and Defensive Strategies. So, in this, uh, you know, there's one table which really, you know, attracted me, where he says the preparedness is, you know, a certain point, where they say high level leadership should be maintained with responsibility and authority. Healthcare providers should maintain awareness of biological agents with bioterrorism potential and consider the presence of unknown pathogens. It's not that always in your laboratory you are reporting the known pathogens. Always have an eye on the unknown pathogens and always look at the diagnosis and look at the clinical features which the clinicians are sending us with. Emergency room and community physicians should be updated regularly about the clinical manifestations of diseases caused by potential bioterrorist agents and emerging infectious diseases. We should have personal protective equipment which should be improved to become more user friendly. Improved surge capacity, that is the ability to rapidly gear up the health system to cope with a sudden large increase in patients with a serious contagious disease. So this improved surge capacity is required particularly in peripheral areas. They are the peripheral areas which the terrorists target and they are the ones who suffer to the maximum. So the capacity of general and reference laboratories should be increased to keep developing faster, more reliable diagnostic tests. So there should be a system of peripheral laboratories reporting to the state. State again reports to the national laboratory. So certain protocols have to be prepared and the people should be well trained. New and improved vaccines. It could be pre-exposure, some could be post-exposure and treatment regimen should be developed. Clinical and environmental surveillances need to be increased. Syndromic surveillance systems can be maintained to register suspicious or confirmed cases reported by physicians. And the data can be used to improve risk communication programs and to monitor progress of an outbreak. And an adequate stockpile of vaccines and medications should always be maintained, both nationally and internationally. And the international togetherness and international uh, friendliness is very, very important when it comes to bioterrorism. So to improve preparedness for natural and bioterrorist outbreak, international cooperation should include joint exercises involving multiple countries and constant improvement in the exchange of information on potential bioterrorism threats and knowledge. I'm sure you will all agree with the points I had picked up and uh, noted down uh, to uh, just give you a highlight on how we prepare if, uh, if there's an event of bioterrorism. So we need to actually work on the bioterrorism uh, uh, you know, preparedness and then uh, uh, probably uh, we'll achieve some kind of development in the developing countries. Thank you very much for your patient sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Savita. You know, it was a very, very balanced uh, uh, kind of presentation where you could actually take us through the history of uh, bioterrorism, but at the same time, giving enough uh, stress on the kind of preparedness what we had to have as a country, as a healthcare system, etc., etc. Like um, Roosevelt has said, the more you know the history, the better you would be prepared for the eventuality or the, for the future. In our case, it is eventuality. So I am sure, you know, by knowing the history, which otherwise would be looking like, you know, a boring exercise, but unless we are going to draw from the past experiences, we will not be able to sharpen our arsenal of preparedness, right? Uh, thank you very much for drilling down into, uh, you know, who had to do what uh, from the international community to the international organizations to your central government, state government, individual healthcare uh, provider to individual healthcare worker. You know, everybody had a role to play in the kind of uh, eventuality when we have the bioterrorism. Uh, definitely, you know, today it is a big debate uh, whether the current COVID-19 is a man-made disaster, right, or it is a natural disaster right in terms of pandemic 
but whatever it may be, you know, we may have differing opinions depending on to which region we belong to or, you know, to which country we belong to or, you know, depending on our political ori orientation or many other things. But one thing is for sure, if we assume or if we have an iota of doubt that this is a laboratory done kind of microorganism which has created that kind of worldwide distress and also you know thrown out of gear uh, the human activity on this earth then definitely you know it shows that uh, what is the what is going to be uh, the effect of a particular microorganism when it is going to be released for the purposes of terrorism how much is going to be the impact i think what we have seen you know like one of my senior friends had been joking the other day what we have seen is only a trailer in terms of actually the genotic uh, or you know bio uh, kind of things you know which are going to disrupt the human activity on this earth i think what we have seen is a trailer in case if there is going to be some kind of eventuality where a particular nation a rogue nation or a rogue organization either it is a terroristic organization or some other organization if it is going to come out with uh, uh, some kind of you know uh, disruptions with microorganisms we need to be prepared i think you have stressed enough on uh, those activities you know which are to be uh, taken care of at every level of the society and the community thank you very much it was very enlightening and very interesting uh, some of those points actually you know uh, you read but forget i think you know you have refreshed uh, our our memory uh, for those past events, you know, which have uh, sometimes, you know, you, you tend to forget. But I think refreshing them uh, keeps you alert that, you know, you need to you need to always be ready for that kind of eventuality. Thank you very much. And um, uh, now uh, uh, probably um, I request once again all the participants uh, to uh, participate in the quiz because unless we are going to assess ourselves, just uh, listening to uh, whatever interesting presentations uh, our our speakers you know esteemed speakers actually bring with a lot of their effort uh, would not actually be useful unless really we uh, we make uh, uh, assessment so i request actually all of you to uh, make uh, good use of it uh, and assess yourself and in case if it is required, you know, revisit because, you know, all these videos are going to be made available to you. So, uh, you know, maybe if you want, you can revisit also. And those of the colleagues, you know, who could not actually be present today for various reasons, you know, they can always actually go back and visit uh, the video which is going to be made available. And please do not forget, you know, when you are going to go to the YouTube, please ensure that you are going to subscribe to the channel which is where you, know, you are going to automatically get all the videos of the past and the future also, right? Please ensure that you are going to subscribe and, and if you like, you can also even like making actually the authors of this content uh, happy and also satisfied. You know, that is probably also our responsibility to encourage uh, our speakers, right? By saying that we like it, right? So that is another thing, you know, which is uh, very, very, very important. So coming now to the next session, before actually, you know, we, uh, we go on to the uh, quiz, right? I am sure, you know, there are plenty of questions which uh, 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 Mr. Prana would actually read out and uh, pose it to Dr. Savita so that at least few of them could be answered. Uh, then, you know, we would actually close it by announcing what is going to be the next session and the name of the session and the uh, presenter of the next session. Over to uh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Rangaradi, and thank you, Dr. Shavita. It was a really, really excellent session. I see a lot of comments uh, saying that, uh, 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 giving a praise to this session. Uh, nobody can question history, probably, probably that is the reason. I don't see any questions uh, from the speaker. All are the praise only. The words of praise. Uh, excellent session. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 
so thank you very much for this very interesting topic thank you all thanks uh, and congratulations dr shavita for your wonderful and informative presentation excellent presentation thank you ma very much so these are the kind of uh, uh, message i can see i don't see any questions uh, that made that uh, maybe the kind of a comprehensive uh, compilation of all the facts and figures uh, and be with beautiful pictures you have put forth is really really very good so congratulations uh, dr shavita for making a session very very interesting thank you sir. thank you thank you very much uh, dr shavita once again um, i would actually request you were very quick comment on one thing uh as you know as of now probably we do not have india as a country doesn't have bioterrorism preparedness manual or the action book right uh you know definitely it is uh, the need of the hour right if the government is not putting it so the people like us the organizations like us like in infection control academy uh, had to take the initiative at least to stimulate the right kind of discussion on this front what do you think you know where does it need to start in terms of actually preparing a road map for india uh, to okay. have a bioterrorism preparedness manual or the road map where does it start and what should be the elements how you could go about it yes that's what i was looking at the other countries uh, how they have made their preparedness manual or plan so what i see is the first and the important um, um, the responsibility is from the administration they see that administration takes the responsibility and they do the training of everybody concerned with uh, you know uh, them where it could be the public health officials or it could be uh the public uh, against the panic or it could be the surveillance department so they link up the whole law thing they've studied the whole pattern of bioterrorism and administration from the center uh you know they, they work completely uh, as a country and from the center they you know they train the state and the local uh, authorities so i think they should start from the center from the administration and uh, from there uh, we need to start and uh, um, probably we need to make our own protocol and uh, stick on to it well you know just to add on to you know what dr sarita said is definitely you know we need to start somewhere and uh, it had to start from the head not from the tail probably that is very very important um, you know living in various countries you know i have seen the experiences of various healthcare systems uh two notable things i have noticed was one in uh, russia uh and the second one was in spain where you know the bioterrorism is really taken very seriously and they prepare actually not only the healthcare workers but even the communities uh to to immediately respond whenever there is going to be uh, some alarm right and there is an elaborate system of this actually alarm and an elaborate system on coping with uh, any kind of uh, you know uh, situations or outbreaks which might happen because of the bioterrorism <clears throat> i was surprised actually to see in spain how uh, the curriculum school curriculum would have some of these elements on what do you need to do in case of you know uh, some of the bioterrorist activities and uh, even in russia i have seen the same thing that within the curriculum of the high school and you know the the university you have got this special uh, drills you know which is conducted with the general population like you know what is what they do in uh, japan uh, japan of course i haven't seen the bioterrorism preparedness at a community level but i did see actually there the preparedness for earthquakes which is a very frequent phenomena in japan there you know the drill goes on almost you know every every uh, month uh, or even sometimes even more frequently actually they they take very seriously the drills so uh, probably you know while the guidelines are going to get prepared probably at community level if we had to bring the awareness like in case of actually infection prevention and control where it is everybody's business within the healthcare system uh, we had to consider uh, bioterrorism preparedness is the business of every citizen in the country i think with that uh, note uh, probably 
uh, I would thank once again Dr. Savita for a very, very interesting uh, presentation and bringing to the core uh, a very, very serious topic, especially considering uh, the current uh, COVID-19 situation. So now is the time actually to say goodbye to each other with this session. And uh, with one word, once again, you know, uh, please do encourage uh, your colleagues to participate in these sessions. Please do share with your colleagues actually uh, the links for the videos so that you know they can also get an opportunity to uh, view and uh, get educated on this front. And uh, and one one more thing which is left out out of me as a, a chairing person for this session is to announce the next session. Next session is going to be uh, uh, done by Dr. Saurav Maithi. Um, you know he is. Um, uh, going to uh, run the session on biosafety with class three and four pathogens, a transportation of sample. That is what uh, is going to be. Uh, as we all know, in the current COVID-19 situation, uh, the uh, sampling and also sam sample transportation, uh, these are the things you know which have become a, a very hot issue. I think you know a lot of lot of questions probably would be also. Uh, be raised by the people, and uh, I'm sure you will get uh, relevant answers from Dr. Saudo, who is a very experienced and very enthusiastic upcoming uh, infection preventionist from Kolkata. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Stay safe. I, I want to see you all alive even in next sessions. Thank you very much. Namaste.